telling. So sounds good. Right. Cool. Cool. And we're recording. Mm-hmm. That was not fun. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay, guys. Hello, hello, hello. You guys are awfully quiet. I see um, somebody finally chimed in. Okay, you got Otam, R. Cool, Aria, very cool. Hey, where are you guys hailing from, by the way? What part of the world are we um, participating Patrice, from? Joel, Kira, Chantal. What's up, everybody? Glad to hear that you're excited about the webinar. We got a really cool guy here, a Christian. So looking forward to Jamaica, uh, a Australia, little time. Denmark, Maryland, Spain. We're all over the world. Yes. Spain. Welcome, everybody. Germany. I have very fond memories of Denmark, um, for sure. That was uh, many years ago. I was traveling with Disney, and uh, we got a chance to stop at Denmark. I was always impressed with the amount of languages people spoke at that part of the world. Uh, Belgium, it's like five, six languages at a drop of a hat. It's crazy how language literate um, people are in that part of the world um, can be, you know, just by virtue of being so geographically in the middle, you know, of all the different countries. So it's pretty neat. You got Colombia representing in the house. Colombia. Uh -huh. Arias we got Iran. Iran. Australia is practically tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> how's, it, how's it going? What can I look forward to? Uh, Juventia uh, in Australia. <laughs> Germany in the building. Yes. Welcome, Germany. Oktoberfest is coming up shortly. All right. Very good. Oh, we got Greece represented. That's great. Oh, we got some people from the States, a little South Carolina, Maryland, Providence, you know. We got what's up in London. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> A little New York flavor transplanted to London. That's funny. Anyway, guys. Well, welcome, guys, to everyone here. Uh, this is so great to see the participation. Um, I am spoiled for sure today. Um, you know, I always say it's going to be an exciting webinar, but um, you know, I've been two for two uh, with uh, figure drawing. This is our second figure drawing uh, webinar. And uh, it's been great because I, you know, was lucky enough to have Patrick Jones, um, you know, about a month and a half, two months ago. And um, now we're getting Christian Nakorda. Anyway, we're so thrilled to have him here. And um, but uh, anyway, guys, we're so excited because it's all about figure drawing and it's a topic near and dear to my heart. So, I mean, for those of you guys who are interested in growing uh, your art foundation skills by improving your knowledge of anatomy and getting to your next level as an artist, then this is gonna be for you guys. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Frank Cordero and I'm the host of today's webinar. For those who don't know me, I'm a traditionally trained artist in drawing and illustration former cleanup animator from Disney, former concept and associate art director at Electronic Arts. Uh, I do freelance 2D and 3D work, uh, you know, both in interactive and in graphic design. And I currently do content marketing for CG Master Academy. Um, and uh, anyway, so we're excited to have our CGMA audience, um, you know, uh, we have an uh, instructor, anatomy instructor, teacher, Christian Nakorda, and he's going to be sharing some of his amazing uh, professional uh, insights and experiences, especially in the areas of figure drawing. Okay, so cool. Um, oh, and um, speaking of CGMA, today's webinar is sponsored by CG Master Academy. Uh, CG Master Academy is the leader in online digital arts education and art visual effects, games, and now animation, CGMA always uh, strives to offer the artists uh, the highest quality education through the most affordable, accessible, and relevant courses in the world. Uh, as a team founded by artists, four artists were committed to enabling you to become a better artist by learning from the industry's best. 
All right. And uh, speaking about the industry's best, you know, let's go ahead and introduce Christian Narcota. Let's kind of do a little bragging about him. All right. So uh, Christian, um, you know, when he first started, was a sculptor at Atomic Mon Monkey. He got a chance to work on projects like The Simpsons, Family Guy, Uncharted, Halo, and Bioshock. Uh, he was a maquette sculptor for two Disney films, Chicken Little and Meet the Robinsons. Um, he started doing observational uh, drawing uh, instructing at Art Institute of Orange County. And um, he does fundamental design, sculpting for animation, and painting at Art Institute in Lynn Pile, in Lynn Empire. I just tripped over my own tongue. Duh. Uh, anatomy for animation. That's got to be an interesting class to teach at Norco College. And he is an anatomy instructor for CGMA. This guy is a teaching powerhouse. Dude, man, so good to have you. So, thank so you. Good thank to have you. you. Happy to be here. And thanks for having me, Frank. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem, man, dude. So, I mean, I mean, you know, how's how's your day going? How are things? I mean, the it's it's going good. Um, yeah, I just to update that because I think that's like I, I haven't been at Norco for a while, but yeah, currently I'm at CGMA. I've been here since 2014. Uh, love it. Um, but yeah, I also at, um, if you guys are familiar with art schools here in Southern California, I, Art Center in Pasadena, um, at Cal State Northridge, and also another um, school, uh, Brainstorm um, school. So yeah, juggling four schools right now, but, and primarily teaching the same thing, anatomy, um, figure drawing stuff, uh, head drawing, construction, portraiture. So mostly all illustration stuff. Okay. Well, just before we get started in the webinar, I just wanted to give a little note to our attendees. Uh, please put your questions in the dedicated QA part of the chat. Uh, and we're going to do our best to get as many of the questions uh, worked into the conversations where they're relevant in the conversation. So uh, definitely bring them and add them. Um, we're definitely going to be uh, doing a sort of a Q&A format with some potential demonstration and show and tell by Christian. So uh, we're kind of um, feeling it out a little bit, but there is an organizational thread in the questioning. So, um, you know, but we're going to go right into Q&A. And, you know, right off the bat, man, um, you know, I definitely wanted to ask you, uh, you know, I guess the question that a lot of us have to face, you know, as artists is, you know, what was it like when you were growing up and you discovered you wanted to be an artist? Was it something that you discovered early or was it in your teen years? And also how did the family kind of receive that? You know, because, um, you know, maybe in certain families being an artist is, um, you know, Hey, you know, we've had other artists in the families or we've had musicians, we have actors and, you know, you being an artist is really cool. And then we have other families where maybe it's a little, not so, you know, as embraced. Where were you in the sliding scale of that spectrum? Um, I most definitely did not have other artists in my family. Uh, I was I was the first, and it was met with hesitation. I would say, as a, I mean, the thing is, I've been drawing forever. I can't remember not drawing. Um, I, my my earliest memory of of, of drawing, I th it was like five, and my dad would take this. This dates me because this is like the eighties, but like it was the the super friends action figures, like the DC action uh -huh. figures. My dad would take like Batman and he would place it on a piece of paper and then we would just chase the outline of them and then he would move it. And then he's like, draw the rest of it. Like draw the rest of his costume and stuff. Like that's the, yeah. my earliest memory of it. Um, but my dad was an engineer. My mom was a nurse. Uh, most of my family is, is in that it's the medical field or engineering. Um, so I always wanted to be an artist. I don't think there was ever, I think there was a time in high school where I was like, it's probably not realistic and maybe I should think about getting doing like drafting or doing engineering. Uh, I took an engineering class, like a drafting class in high school and I failed miserably. Um, I remember I came in super confident. My dad's a civil engineer and the teacher was like, that's great. And then I failed this class. Um, and, and then I was just like, wow, I'm probably going to end up being homeless because there's nothing. That's like not quite the, the chip off the old block. Maybe. No. No, I, I, I'm like, I like organic soft curves. I'm not, I'm not big on that, big straight lines. But anyway, yeah, I, um, I luckily, you know, everything kind of worked out. Um, you know, I was really active in, in school with like, with my art. And then 
somehow that got to this day i was a junior in high school and i got all these recommendations to a bunch of like schools around here like um i, I was just getting contacted from schools my junior year, and i didn't know who still who was recommending me to this day uh, but yeah you know i, I landed I, I kind of went to school even still when i was in school i wasn't my family was like you know like well let's are you having fun at least you know like kind of condescending but after a while like once things started to really play out, like, yeah. I think I got. But they're going off to the side. He's still doing it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why is he? Is he's gonna pay for dinner with those drawings? Like that's great. Uh, uh, but hey, um, uh, just just curious because uh, you know, we get a lot of teachers from CGMA from around the world. But you happen to be, you know, born and raised in the LA area. Uh, do you think your location or your geography? you know, influenced your artistic pursuits in any way? I mean, just the fact that you were here in LA or could could you have been an artist anywhere, you know? I mean, I think there was a big, like, honestly, my, my big influence, I see a question from Amrit. Is that Am my my homie Amrit? I know. What's up, Amrit? Um, yeah, I, I think for me, I live specifically Southern California, like 35 miles east of Southern California. So my... I, and I have to give credit to my dad. My dad was a huge dork, which is why, obviously, <laughs> I'm a huge dork. But, like, I grew up at comic book shops, like, in the, like, 80s and 90s. My dad was a hardcore comic book collector. So, like, the weekends was just, like, comic book shop after comic book shop after, after comic book shop. Uh, and that was, I would say, probably one of my biggest influences as a really, really, like, young artist, you know. Um, so... I, 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 geographically, if, if we want to say that, like having Frank and Sons, if you guys are local, you guys know what that is. And like, you know, just comic book shops up the wazoo around here. Um, that kind of was a big influence for me. So in the beginning, it sounds like um, it was drawing. Uh, but at some point, you started becoming, developing your, your interest as a sculptor. You know, was it traditional sculpting with clay or other media or was it digital? I don't, you know, I'm trying to get a frame of reference for the CG arc, you know, so to speak. And where you fit in, if you did, you know, because, um, you know, I started out as the traditional baby uh, in this industry, um, you know, drawing on paper and then, you know, everything changed. So anyway, right. it'd be interesting to hear your story on that. I am, um, you know, it was always drawing for me uh, in the beginning. Um uh, you know, now, at my age now, it's all important, right? Drawing, painting, sculpting. Even if you're not great at them, it's good to practice all three of those things, uh, traditionally and digitally. Uh, but, you know, like, I, I took, I remember, like, my first figure drawing class that I took a, in school. My teacher was like, oh, looking at my drawings, she's like, you're a sculptor. And I was like, what? Mm. Um, and she was like, you, you're a sculptor. I can tell you draw form. And I'm like, I've never sculpted a day in my life. She's like, oh. She's like, well, when you do sculpt eventually, you'll be good. Uh, and then, like, literally the next semester, I took the sculpting class, and, like, my life made sense. It was weird. Like, everything fell into place. I got straight A's for the first time. Like, uh, <laughs> it was really, it was, yeah, I, I loved it. I fell in love with it. That's great. That's great. The angels were singing, you know. People were clapping in the hallways, you know. Yeah. Just everything's aligned. Yeah, it, it's, the, for, the, for the record, I've not had too many moments like that in my life. But when it happens, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's great to hear. So nice to have gotten A, the feedback, and B, that kind of reinforced by seeing success in the sculpting class, which is great. Right. So, um, were you like one of these um, artists that kind of were fairly one-tracked as an artist, or did you have any outside interests in parallel to your art? Like, I don't know if you played any kind of sports in the streets so the kid like i played little league a little bit street football you know stuff that kids do but some people take it to you know another level you know i don't know if that was anything that was part important to you you know but uh anyway i i never played sports in like uh an official capacity so like for a league or anything i think like this mm -hmm. is you know i was there's two like me and my sister and my there's a seven-year gap between us uh, i'm the older yeah. one um and, you know, I think like with first, I, I don't have kids of my own, but I just, from my experience as being the older child, um, I was the one they figured everything out with. And then they're like, okay, let's get it right with, with the, the next one. <laughs> um, so like, I didn't, I didn't have like, I didn't have NJB. I didn't have anything like, you know, I, I, I literally had 
paper and pencil because it was affordable. Um, my sister had like ballet and like tap and jazz, and, you know, gymnastics and all of that. Um, I have no yeah. official capacity in that, you know, like, and I'm, I'm not resentful at all about any of that. You know what I mean? But I think yeah. a lot of that just like, I, I liked, I don't know that it was, it was easy for me to just pick up pencil and draw. Um, so. Yeah. I, yeah. I relate to that sort of single mindedness um, uh, as a kid and, and drawing was always fun, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, if it, it was related to storytelling, comic books, Godzilla, Star Wars, you know, anything on, on that front that uh, I was in, you know, so that's great. Um, let's uh, kind of start transitioning kind of like from when it was the younger part of being an artist to when you started realizing uh, this was going to be something you wanted to do for a career. Um, you know, uh, talk a little bit about your educational background in college beyond and then how you made the transition. So I um, went to school, my, my major was um, animation, right? And this is, I did computer animation. I started school back in 2000. So, you know, we didn't even have, we didn't even have like flash drives. We were like burning our homework onto CDs. Um, it was, yeah, it was rough. Uh, but um, <laughs> it, it, I, it was after I took the sculpting class, it, everything like kind of shifted. Um, and, you know, it was a traditional sculpting class. The My teacher, um, at the end of the class offered me a job because he owned the Tommy Monkey owned the, the toy company. So I like halfway through school, I was like, you know, working uh, as a sculptor at a toy company and like all the way till like 2010, 2012, you know? Um, so that like, obviously that was a transition. There was, there was a very, there was, there was a time where I almost didn't finish school. Like it was just like, why do I need to finish? I'm already working. Thank God. I'm glad, I'm happy that I did. That would have been a huge mistake had I not finished. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, my degree, my degree is in animation, so like you know, like it was, it, it was, it was crazy too, like juggling school and working um, at that time, at that age. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I, I, wow. I've always been working. Like my first, I think I was like 15 when I got my first job at the mall, like mm -hmm. at Wesley's Pretzels. But like to juggle, like you know, full time school and like full time work is like, I, you know, and then working like going to school in Santa Monica working in Burbank and like having to commute from there, like in the middle of the day, like having to transition the 101 and the, the 134, like the 405 and the 101 was a nightmare every day. But, you know, and like I'd be, and then I'd be at work till like 11 and then I'd go home. I'd have no time for homework and then have to wake up at seven in the morning for school. Um, but, but you figured out how to do it. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, there's something about the whole, and we were just talking about it before the webinar about the idea of sometimes when you're the most busy, you're getting even more stuff done. Right. You know, and I think that sort of you've been sort of talking, you've been doing that in your life already. Uh, I used to envy the kids who didn't have a job um, while going to college and they yeah. could just focus on school. But I realized that a lot of those kids weren't just focusing at school. They were going to parties and all this other stuff. So it was like, great, you know, they did the college experience, but I'm like, you know, when it came down to the work, were they getting more reps, you know, and right. suddenly made the time that I did have leave left uh, count more, and maybe that was a similar experience for you. I mean, I like, okay, so I, this might be like too revealing about myself, and like, I'm, I'll just be brutally honest, like, you know, I, I look back, and I, I, I'm not shy about this, I'll talk about this with my own students, like, if there's anything yeah. that I have like regrets about when I was a student, um, it was I, I'll say it. It was my arrogance. Um, I I've always drawn, and I felt like when I when I got to class and I saw other students work, and it was like subpar, and I'm, I would be like, why am I working so hard? You know, like my mentality was, I just need to be better than these people. So I would yeah. turn in half-assed work. You know, uh, th granted, this was like 20 years ago, but like. You know the mental like if I was to do school again, like I would like just double burn everybody, I guess. Um, but you know, I I think I found an old journal. Ah, it's so lame. I found an old journal from when I was in school, and um, I was writing about me and my roommate at the time, and I'm like, like I was just so arrogant, like just talking about like how how good our work was compared to other people, and like I regret that so much. I like regret like having that hmm. that mentality turning in half-assed work because I felt like I just needed to be better than those people. Like, I think like, you know, the thing that I missed out on that I didn't realize it was like, I'm not just competing against people in my class. 
I'm competing against everybody else at that school, but I'm also competing against other people at other schools and working professionals already. You know what I mean? So I, I didn't, I could have developed more when I was in school had I not had that mentality, I think. Uh, because yeah, you know, I did, I did work and I did school, but I also like partied too. You know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. there's a lot of things that would obviously do differently uh, if I could go back. Hey, look, but. the social part is a part of the uh, educational experience, even if it, you know, uh, is not directly related to art, but I, I'm a, I'm a big believer that you need to have some version of a life to have something to say with your work. Um, otherwise it's all about being at the desk so much that, you know, you're a tool, but you don't have much to say. So I do think that that part is valuable regardless. And uh, um, I understand what you're saying about the whole uh, talent versus practice. You know, like if you're like God given talent, you know, like, and you got that in spades and I kind of relate to a little bit of that sense um, I think if you know it, that's almost worse than not knowing. Yes. Because yeah. if you know it, then you're not as, you, you don't feel like you have something to prove. Uh, but if you don't know it or don't really realize your value yet in some ways, and that was my burden growing up as an artist, right. um, I just like kept on doing work till someone said, hey, you know, that actually looks pretty damn good. But in my mind, it was never enough. Right. And I think a lot of artists, kind of relate to that mentality a little bit of, you know, feeling like there's never enough practice. And that's hard because that's a, a hard burden to carry sometimes. And then there are other times where I was like, I look back, I was like, holy shit, I was like better at this age than I even realized. And then the, the flip side is true. If you think you are, you know, so good that you don't need to put in extra effort, then I do think the uh, people who work harder um, tend to win out over time you know, because they know where they are in terms of the level of good. So it's it, it's been an interesting thing. And I've seen that in, in the education levels and um, I've seen it in my own life. Um, and it's interesting to hear it from, you know, fellow artists like yourself who had to wrestle with this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I have, that's my mentality now. Like after school, I feel like my development happened so much more. I, I developed as an artist so much more after school. Um, I think it was just, just when I'm working, and then it was like not having school. I don't, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this because I'm a teacher, but like, I think having, being able to develop things on my own time, being able to develop like the things that I wanted for my portfolio on my own time, you know what I mean? And then actually just picking and choosing, you know, and not yeah. having to like worry about like gen ed classes or whatever. Um, yeah. Like, you know, that's, I think like my, especially with figure drawing, like I really, really like picked it up more so after, well after school. Um, you know, I, and I think also it was like a way for me to kind of like uh, to kind of go back to Amrit's question, what inspires you to draw every day? Um, I, it's it's actually what's relaxing to me. Like, I feel like that's where I have control. You know what I mean? Like if if you're ever in a place in, when, when your life where it's just like you don't feel like you have control of things that are happening, like at least for for an artist, for me, like that's, you know, if, I, if I'm just sitting down with my iPad or like with a piece of paper and just drawing, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like getting ideas out. I, I'm not censoring myself. I, and it's just like, I get to like, just explore be creative and, you know, just release for a little bit. Um, so, yeah. So that's, that's it for me. Um, and then also just like that, that improvement, you know, like seeing that, like yourself improve, uh, like constantly, it's just like you were saying, like, you know, there's never enough, enough practice, you know, like you, we, we're always learning, we're always growing. Right. It, you'd be foolish to say, like, I know everything about the subject now. Like, we're, we're always learning. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. And, um, you know, I, I was definitely thinking about, um, well, you know, we're trying to I guess we're, we're talking about being artists in general. Um, there was a question here from uh, a follow up question, actually, from Joel. He said, can you say more about how your drawing revealed your sculpting talents? And, and I guess maybe, um, maybe, or was there anything specific about the way you were drawing that said you're a sculptor specifically, the specific feedback that the teacher gave you, or was right. it sort of uh, post revelatory, you know, you kind of like, Oh, I had the light bulb moment later. Or did she tell you 
you you deal with things because and and I guess the question for me the way I read that question is were you dealing with a lot of defining form or were you a line guy um, that kind of led with that you know and and I think uh, there's a sort of a dynamic that's different depending on your emphasis as an artist in and, and honestly I believe that you need both line and you know form to kind of help create stuff. But there's some guys who are pure line guys, right, you know? Right. I think it's fun to explore both, right? Like, I think you can learn, like, it's you definitely need both to balance out your in, in illustration, right? You want the line and the value. Um, I think it's fun to explore just line, right? I think, like, like just executing things with, like, explicitly line and then vice versa, just, like, absence of line completely, right? Like, just yep. balancing value. Um, and seeing like swatches or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, seeing that as shape, I think like all of that is beneficial. Um, I think when, when I draw, especially at the time, I was like very like cross contouring, uh, not cross hatching. I'm still, t I don't know. It's weird. I think it's because of my, my youth with like comic books. I just, I'm not a fan of cross hatching. Um, I, yeah. I tend to like not let things cross if I can help it. So I'll just like I'll, I'll show you guys some here. Let me show my screen. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, you know, we'd um, love to see some visuals uh, based on what you're. Um, I'll uh, you can, I can. Um, yeah, there you go. Cool. So, um, am I sharing? Okay, cool. Like I have this set up, and we'll do that in a second. But basically, just to show you what I was talking about, like, you know, and this this is like basic drawing stuff. This is not going to be new if you're sitting here, like listening to this. This is not going to be new to you. But like, you know, if you're drawing like a cylinder. Right, we have different ways of like describing the form, right? So I could do like this. I could either go with the form, right, and then I can change my value this way, um, or I can go against the grain. Uh, but either way, no matter what you're doing, like you don't like I can. You always want to be descriptive of the form. So if you are doing like using this stroke, right, to to shade stuff, it's not that this is impossible. Like you can do it, and you can make it look nice. But the thing is, you're already just with your line, already like flattening your form, right? Like we're losing that depth. So I think this is where I was drawing at the, the time. So I was already always trying to like see form, see shape, see the surface um, when I was drawing in the past. But I mean, just to like to kind of go back to like drawing, painting, sculpting, like when I after I started sculpting, it changed the way that I drew. Um, and then same thing when I started painting. I think those are like my two big like moments as an artist in my life was when I started sculpting and when I started painting, it was like, I, I just like, it was a new obsession. Um, I'm going to stop sharing right now. Um, it was like a, this new obsession where like I, from the moment I would wake up to the moment I would go to sleep, it's just sculpting, 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 painting, painting, painting. Yeah. Um, and then just, just trying to like learn and get better. And I don't know. Just, I don't know. But. Well, I would uh, kind of start, transitioning into the guts of today's you know content which is you know analytical figure drawing and um and i want to talk a little bit about the idea of where it fits in in the sliding scale of what i call representational art to abstract art in drawing figure and painting and uh you know my question is what is the role of abstraction play in the world of figure drawing and learning anatomy because we're trying to teach concepts to artists on how to observe human anatomy, but sometimes we have to use abstract concepts to teach them. So where does that fit in with you? Because, um, you know, that's like, uh, I'll give an example. When I was a kid, I learned a lot of anatomy, uh, not from photos, but from a guy like George Bridgman, um, you know, and he had a very clear point of view on how to talk about human anatomy. It was stylized. It was his way of doing it. But I learned a lot about his approach. So anyway, maybe you can uh, elaborate more on that. Um, abstraction is a huge part. Like like every drawing that I do, every anatomy uh, construction that we make is based on gesture, right? It's like it's gesture focused. Um, credit to, to Michael Hampton, to Steve Hampton, uh, who's a really dear friend of mine. Um, also, uh, I it's weird saying he's my mentor, but I learned so much from him. It's just weird because we're such good friends. Anyway, um, but yeah, you know, like the the uh, the gesture is, is abstraction. Uh, it, it, the way that I see it, you know, it's a collection of of CNS curves that are, are are collected to represent the figure, and then everything else is based around that. You know, like I, my thing is like 
when I learned originally before I met Steve, um, when I was in school, it was it was not that. It was very detail based. Like so, my teacher would say things like, she she would say like, darling, if the patella doesn't match the model, it's not going to look like the model, darling. And like that's great. And I understand that, you know what I mean? But like her gesture was, it was like her drawings ended up being stiff and, and, and mine were too. When I first started teaching at the school that where I met Steve, like I saw his drawings on the day of my interview, I saw his drawings and I was like, Holy crap. Like it was, it was like a revelation because it was like, yeah, you know, it was the stiffness was gone. It was like these beautiful, like they were dancing. And like my goal now was not to even just get this job. I'm like, I want to get this job so I can meet this guy. I want to sit in on his classes and learn, like relearn everything. Um, so, yeah. so if, if my, uh, the way that like, you know, we, we kind of approach it as if, you know, if, if you can be loose and, and fluid with your gesture drawing, and then every line after that is in respect to those curves, those that abstraction, you can have this beautiful thing. Cause you know, obviously like when you drop in like skeletal forms or you're like, like drawing in like the rigid forms, it, you can't, it becomes stiff. It's just by nature. Right. So, um, we we try to counter that with like uh, as much uh, fluidity in and abstraction in the beginning as possible, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah, to me, I always said that the underpinnings of the abstractions um, of gesture and uh, form are are everything in the initial phases uh, when it right. comes to uh, the energy of a drawing. Um, right. I think you get that almost more directly than trying to aim for drawing an actual bicep. Uh, we we all we always used to talk about drawing in terms of drawing verbs, not nouns. You know, mm -hmm. when it came to actions, especially if you come from an animation background, um, where we're representing actions and thoughts and uh, feelings and 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 everything that's about human expression. So, I think uh, when you look at anatomy that way, you're 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 kind of fueling it with energy, and that translates into movement on the paper. Yes. And I think that's the part where, um, you know, anatomy is like critical, but like you said, you had one teacher, she drew it. It was like a brick wall. Yeah. And then you had another guy, it was just like literally leaping off the page. Mm -hmm. Just the understanding is, is, is different, you know, in terms of the aesthetic and what you're trying to do. So I guess maybe, I mean, I don't know if it's possible to show us a little bit about your process as it relates to yeah, gesture sure. and developing the figure. Maybe maybe you have some samples in in the way you you teach your class and the way you draw yourself that kind of work out some of these problems that we're talking about. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Like so, here's just some examples of um, like gestures, and these these were like literally demos from the class with the model. Um, you know, and I, I we try to I try to think of like it's it's the pure capture of like there's three things that I'm I'm looking to capture in the gesture, right? Like. There's, there's so many things that you need to think about in like the short amount of time that you're doing it. If we're doing this with a live model, you know, you probably have a minute. Some teachers like to do 30 seconds. So it's it's a lot of like thought process in, in a short amount of time. But like the big picture stuff is like movement, right? Like that's number one. That should be your number one priority uh, is capturing that because that's ultimately the story, right? Like that's telling the story of who this person is, the action of what they're doing of, of, or the story. Um, number two is pr proportion. Um, I, I tell people, I can't stress this enough, as much of an anatomy that I teach, it's only second to proportion because like the normal person is going to notice proportion before they notice anatomy, right? If you have stubby legs uh, or if the arms are too long, people will notice that immediately, but people might not notice that you you unintentionally connected your extensor carpe radialis uh, to the ulna instead of the radius. Like they're not going to know that, you know what I mean? Uh, but like this, like proportion, they will know. Uh, so like movement, um, proportion, and then obviously like using anatomy for consistency. There's so many different processes for, for gesture. Uh, I think like, you know, if if we're not organized with this, this can become a jumbled mess, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can come back to this, like looking at a page of gestures and like be confused about what they're looking at. You know what I mean? Like, oh, is that a left leg or a right leg? You know what I mean? So I think yeah. like having organization uh, is is kind of key like so it's that balance of, of like you know having form and not really for because like you i would i would consider these gestures to be more 2d than 3d you know would be like there's some s slight wrapping lines here and there to show form and show direction but for the most part you know that's a pretty 2d um 
um, thing. So like when I get a lot of students that try to do contour, um, you know, so early on, like I, not that that's bad, you know, but like for the process that we're doing for the, for anatomy, you know, I, I, I would advise against it. Um, so when you mean by contour, uh, maybe you can kind of, ex ex do you have any samples of what that means? Like, cause I, I, I understand it one way and then maybe, um, you know, what you're talking about is, is the same thing, but I just want to make sure that, you know, we're clear for sure, our sure. audience. Um, like, yeah, go so ahead. I, this is my Instagram, by the way, if you guys want to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, but, Yay. um, so yeah. these are, these are some drawings from like the classroom, right. Um, and some workshops. Uh, and like, first of all, I don't want to say like when I say not to do contour, I, I'm not anti-contour. I love drawing contour. I'm just saying within the context of like what we're doing for the class, right? Like this is ultimately like what we're, we're trying to do. So we start from this abstraction and then we go from the core and then we are, we're literally constructing anatomy, right? We're creating forms and shapes, simpler shapes that we can turn within space, um, easily uh, and then build our anatomy our actual origin points our insertion points and through that we learn function uh and we you know learn proper anatomy uh, through this so the other like advantage of this is like because we're simplifying these things uh but still in a functional 3d form is that we can invent better you know like this this becomes like it's easier to design right like that's what that is but when i say, say contour like you know like i don't know i would like, you know, I, I'm literally just translating the contours of what I'm looking at as opposed to like being less constructive. So this is more of like a visual trans or like a, a 2D translation as opposed to like what ultimately becomes a, a 3D translation of things. Um, I also do think that, um, you know, you're, you're right when it comes to the conversation of where you are in your development as an artist uh, and also what you're trying to accomplish visually. Um, right. I bring that up because... You know, some of my favorite art heroes, um, you know, like Egon Schiele yeah. or Gustav Klimt, you know, they did a lot of radical stuff with, you know, contour, right. you know, in terms of using line drawing to describe form. But it was a very sophisticated uh, approach in a way that sort of like uh, you, you could tell, like the underpinnings of their knowledge was they understood what you're teaching your students. Right. So it's like, it's almost like ingrained in their process, but they know where to kind of work it in. In other words, they don't always start with an underdrawing, um, even though I know I do still, cause I still need one. Uh, and then I take another sheet of paper. That's just the animator in me, you know, where just throw down a gesture, boom, throw down another sheet of paper, work some major forms, boom, throw around another sheet and then start kind of uh, refining the actual uh, silhouette. Uh, but I think, um, you know, some of my heroes know what you're teaching, you know, they just bypass it. So the question is, you know, what's that balancing act before you lose touch with that? Because sometimes it can flatten out. <coughs> yeah, to me, my, my teacher used to say, I know exactly where you, what you know and don't know as an artist just by looking at your drawings. Right. I, I think, okay, so like for me, it's better, you're, you're a better designer when you are aware of, of what, like, like if you understand what you're drawing, right? Like, I think a lot of times when we're doing observational drawings um, or even like contour drawings is even though we're still analyzing and we're looking at this stuff, like it's not, we're not, it, sometimes when we're just copying, it become it can become mindless. You know what I mean? You're just, yeah. you're just literally translating what can you're happen. seeing. So being more analytical, like breaking down the shapes, understanding the forms that we're seeing will better inform you for the future contour drawings, right? So, um, like that's that's kind of like where I want to just kind of interrupt where you're at right now, inform you of like these forms of 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 the, the human body, and then release you back into the wild, and you can go back to the way you've always been drawing, but now you're just like better at it because you know more. You know, you're better. You understand. You, it. you got your Jedi training. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like a big thing for me too, and like I know like at a lot of atelier schools, like the teachers will. Like it, it's 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 impertinent that the students draw like the teacher, like you are adopting the teacher's way of drawing. Uh, I, I'm very much not that way. Like I understand it, and I I see the value in it, but like I, I in no way do am I trying to make anybody draw like me, um, or or adopt my style at all. Um, I I just want people to continue doing what they're doing. I just want them to be better 
at what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like that's that's basically like my kind of philosophy when it comes to to that. Um, but you know, I, I, again, I'm not I'm not like talking down on like those those kinds of teachers because I, I totally understand it. Also, just makes things like easier to like see progress with people. So, uh, but you know. I was going to ask you about that part though, because uh, it's an interesting uh, conversation part. I had, I, you know, remember going back to school where the, you basically drew like your teacher. And then I had one uh, teacher who he didn't even show us his drawings. You know, maybe once in a while he would do a drawing, he would pull a drawing, you know, while the, the model, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't show us his drawings. He would show us master drawings or he would show us all these different schools of thought, you know, um, he and he always did it with the mindset of uh, trying to teach us um, visual language as artists and how to integrate some of that into our work. Um, so it sounds like to me you're an advocate um, of you know kind of art history and learning a lot of different um, things and different influences uh, when it comes to your education. Yeah, I mean, I, I am. I. I... Uh, love looking at like masterwork too. I mean, to just to kind of speak on what you were talking about with that teacher, like I am a huge advocate. If you're if you're teaching an art class, you should be demoing uh, for your students. Um, yes. I I always um, like you know even kind of to my detriment. Like I think there are times where like oh let's we're doing ten minute poses with the model, uh, and I'll you know I'll I'll kind of scoot everybody over so I can sit down with everybody also. Um, and there are times where, you know, I'm, I'm doing digitally and it's on connected to the projector and like, I feel bad because students are like looking at the monitor because they want to see like an example of what they should be doing and I'm not doing what they're doing. Like I've instructed them to do like, you know, construction. So gesture based shapes, tilts, connections, landmarks. And then I'm like painting, you know what I mean? Uh, because I, I'm yeah. just taking that time. I'm like, oh, I get, this is my time to practice too. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. But I, I think it's important that, you know, you're always as an art teacher, you need to show them like, you know, process too. Mm -hmm. you know, we can talk to stuff about stuff to death, you know what I mean? But like, I think sometimes like, you know, we're visual creatures. Like we, we want to see like steps. I want to see like how you got there, you know, and not just talk about like, uh, you know, the, the end product, but like, you know, the process of it. Uh, but also with, with our history, I think that speaks to a big, bigger part of like, you know, a lot of like what we do with art schools is teach people how, how, to do things uh and i think the the importance of art history is like understanding the why right because i think a lot of times we overlook that the students will overlook like or forget you know like the reason behind the like what they're doing or at least like trying to understand like you know because that that can help them develop their visual style you know is understanding mm -hmm. like why they're doing things like why they're including things why they are not including things in their artwork you know um so Great. No, that's this is awesome, and and I'm just loving this conversation. Um, you mentioned something about the value of learning skeletal landmarks as it connects to shape making and connections. Right. You had to kind of go through, you know, sort of like your hit list, you know, on the figure, you know, for our audience and our attendees. What are like the the ones you should be like always thinking about? So know? if. If you've taken my class, you you already know what this is. So, like, I'll, I'll kind of we'll just walk through it right now. If you can see this, this is like your first step, right? Like, I the I think the value of gesture is this transcends like construction. This transcends um, analytical figure drawing. You can use this for everything. Like, um, and again, it doesn't specifically have to be this style of gesture drawing, um, but you know, just having like this loose layout um, of everything and then kind of building on top of that is really important because that'll prevent you from. Uh, having a really stiff drawing. But after this, like, you know, like my next step after my gesture, if this is my big abstraction, uh, I'm trying to find form in my, like make sense of that abstraction. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for tilts. I'm looking for connections. Uh, I'm looking for mass, right? Um, and then, yeah, I'll go right into landmarks. So the, to me, the big important landmarks that we should be looking for, like what, what I consider a landmark is uh, like skeletal forms that are closest to the surface of the skin. So yeah. A, they have to be visible. Uh, and then B, they have to be symmetrical. So I either see it right down the middle or I see it's like on both sides, right? So yeah. Um, so clavicle, sternum, thoracic arch, iliac crest, right? If I'm looking just at the torso, um, obviously like, you know, we have like the ulna, like uh, there's other things like uh, the greater trochanter, but like if I'm just looking at the torso, that's that. On the back, obviously we have the spine. 
So like, and really identifying the three parts of it, the cervical, thoracic, and uh, lumbar, uh, obviously the scapula, we can't be drawing the back without the scapula and then the sacrum. And then if necessary, the posterior um, iliac crest. Uh, but, you know, like those things are, will allow us to see perspective, right? Because this is what will help us like see things turn things. This will also like um, lead us to this, right? To these simpler forms. So I, I build up to, we build up to these like simpler cylinders and boxes and spheres, not so much spheres, but like boxes. Um, you know, obviously our, our rib cage isn't this rigid box, but a, a rigid, a box, uh, uh, the actual, okay, here's the thing. Let me, let me kind of talk about this. If, Oops, I didn't do that. Um, if I was to just build off of like this shape, right? Because if I was trying to get like a more realistic, accurate shape of the rib cage, like there it is, right? Uh, but the problem is like this egg shape or a sphere is like, ambiguous. If I was to say like add so and so to the right side of this, like who's to say what the right side of a sphere is, right? I might cut it like here and say like this is it, like, but the next person might cut it here. What we're doing is we're we're building these boxes and these boxes are all built off of anatomical landmarks. So ideally, if we were all drawing from the same source material, uh, we should we should all land on the same box, roughly, right? So because like this this edge is defined by the end of the thoracic arch, right? Not just arbitrarily placed um, or uh, built off of a rib cage or just a, a box. You know what I mean? Like this obvious or like a, a sphere. Sorry. Um, so if we don't have that, like, uh, you know, if I'm building like on the limbs, like from cylinders, then I, I'm leaning heavily on the, my landmarks, right? I'm leaning on uh, the placement of my greater trochanter, like the construction of the knee, the perspective of the knee. This is how I get perspective on things, on like the leg is the knee, placement of the hip, ankle, right? On the arm, like that elbow, like that elbow construction and the rotation, pronation, supination of the forearm is like killer, man. And like, uh, and, he, and especially with this, like the scapula uh, and mm -hmm. the, the connection of the arm to the torso is so complicated. Um, and like, I, I think people underestimate like how complicated like the armpit is, right? When people do that, like arm flexing pose and like, just like what's going on right there. It's like really, really complex. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the best thing to attack that is to simplify as much as you can. Um, I think. Like that's how I approach. And then, and then, and the funny thing is, you know, we're in the realm of the abstract to try to get to the real. You know, right. it's funny how that back and forth is so critical to developing uh, your eye. Like, you know, you want to be a better realistic, you know, draftsman. <laughs> you better to learn abstraction, you yeah. know, because it's going to help support that. Yeah, I always kind of feel that difference too when you can't really tell where that part of the body is turning you know yeah it might be a sphere you know but i think from an artistic point of view the idea of using a cube to kind of really clearly commit to what's the top side back i think that kind of forces you to deal with space and form in a very deliberate way so yes i think that's really really cool you know yeah um and I'm sure that it applies pretty much, uh, you know, maybe in a smaller area, um, you know, to your, you know, I know you, you, you teach a class specifically with regards to facial construction, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, tell us a little bit more about maybe some tips for organizing uh, the construction of the head, because I'm sure it follows some of that um, line of thinking, but maybe there are things that are extra reminders and things that could help us be more successful. Absolutely. So like for me, you know, drawing face, like I, I love portraits. It's my favorite thing to draw uh, faces. If I, and I always like to ask people this, especially like, uh, you know, younger artists, like if, if given, if you had nothing to do and somebody just handed you paper and pencil and just told you to wait in a room, like what would you be doodling? Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's faces. I just would just be sitting there drawing faces. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love drawing faces. So, you know, I, I think, you know, for, for a lot of people, uh, it's just like the, the body. You know, I, I need to, I like to explore like the structures underneath uh, because that really dictates uh, what is happening on the surface. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, for the head drawing class, you know, like the anatomy class is intense because it's just like a lot of information that just gets like jammed down your throat. Um, but like for the, the head drawing class, it's like we get to just focus on the head. Uh, so I, I get, we got plenty of time to just, 
explore like one subject. So yeah, I'll take it all the way from like this. You know, we'll we'll start here. Um, just the simple skull. I I like to break down the skull ish shape. Um, so I'm looking for like brow ridge, keystone. I don't actually do the nasal cavity. I go right to the nose. For me, it's like let's just get to the nose. The nose is so complex. Um, so let's let's get to that. Uh, but I'm definitely uh, exploring like uh, the zygomatic arch. Um, I keep the the jaw and the mandible pretty simple until we get into facial expressions, and then we can talk about opening that and like articulating that. Um, and then, but like it's still very much based in like three dimensional form, right? So uh, mm -hmm. again, this is this is what's going to allow you to understand how to draw these things from different angles. I know, like especially for young artists, like certain angles of the face can be really difficult, like this upshot or I don't know, a dramatic downshot. Um, I, and that's what I recommend like students explore is like really push yourself to draw those difficult things because like explore those perspectives, right? Um, and again, simplifying these things into simpler shapes makes makes these things like a little bit more achievable and less uh, less nerve wracking, I guess. Like the nose, I, again, I think people really struggle with it and I, I kind of have broken it down into like six simple planes, right? Like the bridge of the nose is front sides and then I get septum and nostrils, like that's it. But you can break down any anybody's nose into like those six planes right it's just like breaking down those high points of those curves for me um so we can take it from there um and then you know we we talk about facial features so we're, we're basically dropping like observation on top of the construction because once i've done the construction i'm just going to rely on that to like just translate what i'm seeing so i mean you could construct the eye but like i can also just drop it in observationally i think that'll give me like my best result um, and then we'll also like explore muscle. Um, so this this is like super advanced, right? But like I think understanding muscle can un help us understand like facial expressions uh, to understand movement of the face. Because especially if you've gone through like the analytical figure drawing class or anatomy, um, understanding muscles on the face are completely like, they work so differently than muscles on your body. Um, they like serve different a different purpose, obviously. So. Um, and it's really interesting. So, uh, but yeah, we, we go from here and then we talk about fat. We talk about uh, like, cause you know, there's like structural fat on our face um, that, you know, everybody has. And then we talk about gender differences, like what's, what actually is making the differences between masculine and feminine faces. Uh, what, what are so similar because there's a lot of like things that I think people associate to like masculine or feminine features when in reality it's, it's neither. Um, and then, and at least in my opinion, uh, we talk about aging, uh, you know, what happens from like literally from infancy to like, to like old age, like how your face is changing, how you grow into mm -hmm. adulthood and then what happens after all of that. Um, so there's just a lot of things that, you know, we talk about likeness, um, we talk about value, like there's like, it, it's all leads up to uh, invention ultimately in that class, like uh, inventing portraits, um, like rendered, like, it doesn't even have to be realistic, but at least like a feasible, like where you, you're you're showing that you understand the forms and, and like, you know, and like you can explore that with your lighting. Um, but yeah, all of this is just so that, you know, this th doesn't become an issue because when it comes down to it, for me, when it comes to figure drawing, this is the most important thing. Um, I, I feel like if you can draw faces well and you draw hands well, everything else will fall into place. But if if you can if you're awesome with your anatomy but your faces suck, like that's the first place everybody looks, right? Like we're naturally as human beings, that's where we look first when we're talking to other people, right? And mm -hmm. on top of it, all humans, artists or not, are experts at like reading faces. So if if this is not done well, um, your your work is going to kind of suffer for it. So and again, same with hands. Um, but long yeah, way. it's a. Uh... It's look, man. It's it's it deserves the the conversation when it comes to that. So I mean, I I get it, and um, you know, I wanted to ask you about like the way you use time in teaching students when it comes to figure drawing or uh, drawing in general. Um, how does duration of time, you know, impact art quality? And I say that um, because. Some people think, well, if I just put more time into drawing, eventually it'll get better. But I do believe the, the reverse can also happen too, which is you can overwork a drawing uh, and lose sight of the things that made it special in the, in, in the beginning phases. Um, so how do you kind of use time as a teacher to get your 
your your teaching points across uh, to get them to be better at what you're trying to get your students to learn. I, it's it's about efficiency, I think. Um, I you know I, I think given amount any amount of time, you know, if everybody had an infinite amount of time, like anybody can achieve anything, right? But it shouldn't it shouldn't be that. Also, also as a professional, you don't want to like just spend forever on something because that's that's money out of your own pocket. But you know, I, I think when when you kind of set a time limit for yourself on executing an illustration, uh, it that's where. Let me back it up. I I'm not like when it comes to like art in general. I love hyper realism. I think it's fantastic, but that's not what I I, I do. Um, I, as much as I appreciate it, uh, I'm not looking for hyper realism. I love seeing brush strokes. Like I love seeing like pencil marks. I love seeing that. Um, I think that's an important aspect in art. You know, I think that like leaving brush strokes in your artwork or leaving tool marks in your sculpture is reminding the the viewer of of the medium. As as realistic as you might get in in certain places, you always want to remind people what they're looking at. You know what I mean? So to me, like I like seeing looking at somebody's painting and seeing a single like whoosh, like one big paint stroke on the forehead, and it's like wow, that's how they transition from like the half tone to their light like really nicely. Um, I, I just like that. Um, and, you know, I think if if we can think in that, like, efficient way, like, you can do anything after that, right? If you want to finesse it more, right, you can do that. But like you said, there, there is that, that danger of overworking things, I think, especially for, like, traditional artists. I, I'm sure, again, if, if you're an artist and you've, you've drawn anything or painted anything, you, you've, you've experienced this where, you're, like, you feel done. You're like, ah, I feel good. And you walk away for 10 minutes, and then you come back and you're like, you know what? Let me just do this one thing, and you do it, and you're like, "God damn it! I messed it up. I ruined it." You know what I mean? So it's like you you kind of have to gauge like where when are you done? And like, there's that famous quote like, "Art is never finished; it's it's merely abandoned." Right? Like, and I think we can kind of relate to that. Like sometimes, sometimes you're like, I, I you always feel like you could do more on something, but you're like I just I have to be done with it. I have to walk away from it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think like finding that I read when I was really young, I, I read this article about this woman and she talked about how she takes her, she takes her work to 95%. She never goes a hundred percent. So she always leaves out that last 5% and that prevents her from like overdoing it. Right. And I, I always took that to heart and I was like, Oh man, dope. I'm, I'm 60. Shoot. Like leave out that last 40%. Like just keep it really loose. Uh, but no, I mean like, but realistically, like that's, that's kind of, you know, digitally, we don't have to worry about that because you can always undo, you can erase a layer. You know what I mean? You can have like iterations saved, uh, but traditionally you kind of have to kind of watch it there a little bit. Well, you know, and it's funny that you mentioned that. I was going to segue to the role of digital tools and, and how they've kind of impacted you and your art making process. And, you know, by extension also too, we've lived in the last, you know, I've seen so much change in the last 30 years, you know, artistically since I started working, you know, in the field, you know, the advent of 3D packages work, you know, like ZBrush, you know, that's just probably created a whole new dimension to being an artist, to learning it, to so many different things. I mean, you know, have they been helpful to you? Um, and do you go back to paper from time to time, you know? Um, I every once in a while like the daredevil uh, effect of working on watercolor paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am still, I'm still, when it comes to painting, I learned painting in um, acrylic. Uh, so, which was like trial by fire. Cause like, you know, you mix a color and you got five minutes with it before it dries out. Um, which, which is nerve wracking. Cause you just have to repaint, re redo things. But no, I, I love digital medium. I, I think I haven't actually made, a traditional painting since 2018 honestly if i'm thinking about it um i just really enjoy digital painting because i can like be anywhere right i can like be sitting on the couch i don't have to like replenish my like paint supply i don't have to go out and buy canvas or cold press board um or like clean my brushes it's just it's right there um i i had a, this conversation with my girlfriend about it because we have other friends who are like purely traditional artists and like I, I've shown them like, hey, check out this painting. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. What is that gouache? I'm like, oh no, it's digital. And they're like dismissive. They're like, oh, pfft. it's that's not that's not her. And I think that that thing about like 
traditional artists that they think that there's like an art button on the keyboard. Like you just press a button and it's like, it becomes art and like, don't understand how, like how digital like art works. Um, you know, like it's, it's not that it's necessarily, it's cheating. I, and I don't, I def, absolutely don't think that any kind of digital medium is cheating. It's just, it's just another tool, right? It's just also like there to, to make things a little bit easier. Now, you know, I, I think like when we're talking about like pers- like laying out perspective as opposed to like laying down primitives in Maya and then doing a quick render and then tracing over that, you know, like it's just another tool to get you to to execute quicker. Right. Um, but like, honestly, I'd rather do that than set up like a three point perspective. Right. And like like actually trying to set up my layout. Uh, but I think it's really important that people understand how to do it longhand. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, it's funny that you mentioned that. I remember uh, when I was first learning how to draw and I was aiming to becoming, um, doing comic book illustration in my senior year. And, uh, you know, I remember taking a heart, you know, John Buscema's How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way book, Mm -hmm. you know, and being able to do a three-point perspective properly. You know, it's rough to draw perspective lines that are running off your comic book page Mm -hmm. and make it all work, you know? And I think... um, you know the mechanics of of making that and 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 doing it it, it it speaks to a certain level of virtuosity that once that paper is stained with either ink or color it's down you you either live with it or you just work around the mistake and make the most of it and and i do think that the preciousness of um maybe physical media creates the scarcity component that i think people still maybe associate with value you know, in yes. some way, uh, where in the learning sense, I think digital art creates freedom to make mistakes. You know what I mean? And it gets away from the preciousness. And that sometimes can help a beginner to be more what I call disposable with ideas. Does that make any sense at all? No, you know? absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So I do think that it's just, to me, I love it all and I'm in it all <laughs> Yeah. because I think that you know, for different parts of the the, the development phase, um, they serve each other, um, especially now. But um, you know, it's hard. You know, to you know where you are. If you're a purist on the traditional art side and you just want to give out real stuff that lives in the real world, man, hats off, dude, man. I love what you're doing to offer that to the world. You know, and then the other people who are virtuosity um, or virtuous artists on the 3D side who are doing amazing stellar things, things that look like we're back in a renaissance, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, the new digital renaissance, you know, I look at that and I'm like, hats off, man. I wish, you know, imagine Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo freaking getting a hold of these tools, you know, exactly what they could do, you know? And I think, oh my God, that's what that, those are the people living now. Um, So they're the new masters now, you know, even though people won't call them that. I think they are, <laughs> right. right? You know, so. Um, but anyway, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation about tools, and 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 again, it comes down to it, your class transcends all of that, though. That's the beautiful thing about analytical figure drawing. So, I think um, you know, really excited that uh, the attendees here get a chance to get a little bit into your brain and how you deal with it. You had mentioned that you had some samples of student work. Oh um, yeah, I actually. Yeah, probably. you know, I would love to see like if you could show maybe some examples of you know where students started or you know and where they ended up or maybe you just had some samples of you know some of their best work you know that came through your class. I don't know. Share uh, some I've samples. I've got stuff. I I could have put more together. These are just a handful of things. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I have like man. So basically, what we do in my head drawing class. Um, I end it with a big creative project. So they get the last few weeks to kind of, I I just encourage them to develop something that they've been working on. So if there's like a story they've been developing, a character that they've been trying to to build up and they just haven't had the time to do it, uh, take my class to do it. Like my only, the only criteria or the thing that I'm asking for in the final is that there's one rendered invented head. Um, Outside of that, you can do whatever. Um, So sometimes we theme it like there was one one semester where we did like a Dungeons and Dragon theme, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, Like they I I encourage them to like literally do an illustration of like their Dungeons and Dragon character. Um, If they play D&D, if they didn't play D&D, like 
we would like try yeah. to make a character for them. We, I like, I'm like, let's bring dice and let's like roll for stats. We didn't go that far. Um, but you yeah. Know, um, so some of these are, are pretty cool. Like here's man, these are, these are from a while ago. Um, but yeah, they're just like gorgeous, gorgeous pieces. Like we kind of worked together on these to just like, well, like, I mean, obviously they did all the work, but like just kind of breaking down, like, from like week to week, from like thumbnails to roughs to like layouts to uh, to like the final color passes um, of what mm -hmm. they were doing. So, um, but just some like really cool stuff. Like this is oh wow, this okay. yeah, cool. this is awesome. So this is from a student Matt um, who didn't wasn't a D and D person. He wasn't a fantasy person. He's more of a sci fi person. But he was like super like oh yeah, I'm totally down to do like something fantasy. Uh, so he kind of mixed genres. You know, he had like a a fantasy mech thing going on but it's just so kinetic um but like it feels like so random and and so like like you know again kinetic but like it, even like down to the design of like where he was putting these flashes was like really well thought out like that changed mm. from week to week um just so we were like framing everything perfectly um but like just really cool stuff um even yeah it's really cool yeah you know we can go from like to the the action of this to the stillness of this and it's still like you know with the lighting it just works really well um so uh but yeah you know like there's i i, I should have put more together uh, from the student work because i have so many so many like brilliant talented students especially uh from here um but you know like it's i think it's the fun one because like the anatomy class we're just building up to to the anatomy but like in this class we get to have a little bit more fun um honestly i i kind of do that just to get to be a little selfish because i think with the anatomy class like um the, the, this is all i get to look at right like i just get to see this by the end but like with the head drawing class i'm like let me see what you actually do you know like i, I want to see like how creative you guys are and like the awesome work mm -hmm. that you guys can do so it's really just for me it's super self-serving uh but hopefully you know the students you know i i think uh it's i think it's okay to feel a little bit um you know, I guess like have a little bit of ownership in that part, even if it's just on an emotional level, you know, with your student success. I think, um, you know, seeing them grow in front of you, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, you get a chance to be a part of that, you know, which is one of the real cool benefits. I call that the pay in teaching. Yeah. You know, yeah, you got a paycheck to, 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 to make a living, but the pay in teaching is seeing your work from your students take what you gave them information wise and then apply it in a way that sees them grow. And I think you, you know, showed some really cool examples of them being able to think with the information you gave them. Right. Uh, which is beautiful. Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, one thing I would, I would be curious about is, is, you know, how do you like, what's a feedback conversation like in your class? You know, students gives you something, you know, sample drawing, you know, how do you handle that conversation? You know, I know CGMA is, you know, you, you give dedicated feedback to your students, but what's the pattern? It, it, well, depending if it's anatomy, it's simple, right? Cause it's just pointing out like things are either right or they're wrong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to like a more creative thing, then, then it's just like exploring like and pushing it to, to execute what they wanted to achieve. So like, you know, if, if they're trying to make something feel a certain way, it's like, what can we do? To, to push that how, how can we push it more in that direction of of that theme that you're going for right so um, both like through color through value um, through um, uh, composition like you know there's there's just a lot of things that, that we're looking for so um, I, I am not like the type who's like the militant teacher I, I'm not the type who's like really sour or like just like pooping all over kids you know um, I, I just, I don't react well to that as a student. Um, and, and, and not to say like, that's a bad thing for teachers. Cause like there, sometimes you have to be that way with certain students, but like, for the most part, it's just like, I'm like, I like to point out what they did well. Like, look at this looks great. I, I point out like something we can work on. And then I always offer like, like here's, maybe this is a solution that we can do. Um, if at all, like, you know, a back and forth is, is best. You know what I mean? Because then maybe there was, I didn't understand the reason behind with it, why they were doing something. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, but either way, it's always trying to come back to um, executing on on the, um, 
of the theme on or of the story at least for me. If you uh, were giving students, um, you know, we're starting to wind up uh, our webinar a little bit. I just noticed that we're a little after one and I want to be sensitive to your time. But, um, you know, if you had to give advice to students these days, I mean, you know, there used to be a time when illustration work was a thing, you know, but it's changed over time. So, so where, where's the illustration work these days and you know, what advice would you give to a student interested in working as an artist, but, you know, maybe they're not in an art job right now or at the beginning of their career, you know, what kind of uh, advice would you give them to uh, you I, know, maybe make that transition? I mean, I think when it comes down to it, and this is probably super cliche to say, but like, you know, what we're doing, like you, you've got to, if, if you're a student and like you haven't made the transition yet, you know, like I get it because like I had to work like while I was in school too. Uh, before I was doing the sculpting job, I was I was working at an elementary school and I was like a crossing guard, you know, so it was like splitting my time. Uh, but like, you know, you'll eventually you'll get to that point where it's just like you you have figured out how you can just purely work on art. You know, it's just full time student and then transition like you kind of are putting yourself into a place where it's like I have to make this work financially. You know what I mean? Uh, which, you know, put yourself in the danger zone. I guess that that's kind of a way to do it. Like you're not giving yourself an option, but like. Also, you know, it, you have to kind of get to that mentality where it's not a hobby anymore. You know, it's like, or it's not just like a thing that you're into um, or like a thing that you like, like this is just your life now. You know, this is your lifestyle. Like art is not a hobby, it's a lifestyle, right? Like, I think once you, you've made that transition, um, you know what I mean? And like, that's that's becomes like your, your life. Like not like, it shouldn't be all consuming because like you said, like it, it's really important to have a social life. Right. I, I, I really encourage students, like, especially when we get to the end of the semester and students are like, oh, I'm going to spend my whole break, like, practicing this and this. I'm like, eh, yeah, cool. But, like, enjoy your life, too. Like, we work so hard during the semester. And I think it's really important for students to take time and enjoy those things that we work so hard for. You know what I mean? Because otherwise, like, what are you doing it for? Um, but I don't know. I, I think, you know, per, like, once once you've kind of accepted that this is your lifestyle, um, and you know, just just always being better. You know, like each each illustration you make should be better than the last one you made, right? Like just if you're just constantly improving, you know, um, and like you're working towards a goal, um, and you know, you you're also just be aware of like what's going on in the industry. You know what I mean? Like, um, like if if your goal is to work at a certain studio, you know what I mean? Maybe that's some that's something to work towards. You know, like adopting that style, or you know what I mean. Um, or, or like, because I, I also think that too, if, if you're, once once you're ready to start like job hunting, you know what I mean? Like you not, I wouldn't recommend just having like one portfolio that you're just shopping around to a bunch of different studios. Uh, I think it's in your best interest to show the studio that you can do their style. So I think your, your portfolio, it needs to be fluid, right? It needs to like, like constantly be changing. And like, like you wouldn't take the same portfolio to like Riot that you would to like Cartoon Network. Right, like mm -hmm. you would want it to change that up. So, uh, be adaptable, um, uh, be open. You know what I mean. There might be things that you focused on, and then you realize like your the job opportunities are not necessarily that. I had students that were like heavily focused on character design, um, end up getting a really successful job doing environment stuff. You know what I mean. Um, so yeah, we we want to you want to master something, but you always you still need to be a jack of all trades. Like it's this weird balancing act. All of us, so, I think um, I spent a lifetime trying to answer that question. I'll be honest, yeah. um, but uh, that's a separate conversation, you know, um, for sure. So, hey, we got a, 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 a one last question from Joel. It came a couple of minutes ago, and I want to make sure we get it in uh, before we end off on this. Um, he said, "With drawing on digital media, how would you advise students um, about using tools like resizing, rotating, distortion, and warp? Are these tools to avoid?" or avoid overusing or should students embrace them <laughs> it's like i'm gonna let you answer i have my own opinion on that front uh so uh you know go ahead and jump I, in i'd actually love to hear your opinion um because yeah i think we all have our opinions on that i'm i'm i think that i'm less of a purist when it comes to 2d on paper 3d i think in the end uh you know by any means necessary, as long as you understand 
what you're getting out of each of those tools to get the working result. To me, you know, there is, you know, the only time artists or other people ask about the tools to me in my mind is when they like the work. <laughs> How did you do it? Right. You know, so what did you use? You know, they always go to the software, you know, it's always hilarious, but really it's just really good foundation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so that's funny to get that question, but when people don't like the work, I, I don't give a rat's ass if you used, you know, all these different tools, in my opinion, um, they just, you know, it didn't work out. It didn't land on the outcome of people digging the work. So I think in the end, I don't like to have any hard, fast rules about that. I just got to know what I'm getting out of each of those tools to get to the end game. That's my opinion. So I 100% agree. Um, I, I would also say that I, I am not a purist about that. Here's my thing. Like if I, I just wouldn't rely on it, like you shouldn't like just, it, there's a difference between like throwing crap down and then fixing everything through like lasso tools and resizing. And yeah. then there's, there's a difference between like laying it down and then like, Oh crap, I need to adjust. Right. Like if you're just refining things like that's cool. But even if that's like your process, like that's your process. Um, I think things that I would avoid from like, if, if you're doing studies, right. Like on my yeah. Instagram, I do a lot of like, like st portrait studies and like from like movie stills and stuff. What I would avoid is like eye dropping from your source um, material. Not that that's like a horrible thing, but that's just a habit you don't want to like start. Cause like you don't always have that. Like if you were <laughs> like, let's say using a digital medium from a live model, you can't like eye drop from the model, right. From like a live person. Um, so you don't want to create that crutch for yourself. Um, I'm not the biggest on tracing either, but I, I, I've had this conversation with other artists and like for like people that are developing their skills to just like see form, that's good. Um, you know what I mean? But if, if, you know, if, if you have till tomorrow morning to execute on something, you know, and you're doing concept art, there's no rules. There should like, I don't know, like whatever it takes, you know, to get things done. Um, I would say if you know, if it doesn't look like you trace it and you did it, they're not going to question it, you know, on that front in the end when it comes to deliverables. But, you know, I, I get the purist mindset. I get the whole, you know, we had, I had a whole conversation with Patrick Jones about the death of drawing, um, you know, was tracing, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's this machine um, that was, it was like an overhead projector, forget the name of the brand, uh, but it was something that was very big in ad agencies. Um where literally it would, you know, take a, a photograph, shoot it down on a table in a dark room and artists would take, you know, sheets of paper and literally kind of basically trace those shapes, you know, and then in the end game, it, it cut down the time of producing work that would normally take a little bit more development time in the early phases, um, you know, and that was a tool that was a common usage tool. Um, you know, back in the day when it was more traditional ahead of uh, digital. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, I think they have a place, but I, you, I think you're right. You could easily fall into a world of crutch and then you're not thinking newly in a new unit of time when it comes to, you know, new stuff. And I think it shows up in the area of invention. You know, when you have to invent the figure, Right. then understanding or lack of it shows up even more. And I think right. that's why your class is really, really critical for people who do anything figurative work, um, you know, whether it's 2D drawing or 3D sculpting. So anyway. Just to go back to like one last time um, to yeah. the anatomy stuff, um, like to me, like I, I think this becomes daunting, like this whole construction process because it's a lot, you know, again, we're, we're literally building this stuff. And the thing we're trying to do is like juggle, like the construction, isolating uh, these individual muscles while still keeping track of like the whole, right? Like not over inflating these muscles, um, like still keeping picture of the overall contour. Um, and sometimes I get students that are like, oh, like they, they, they don't understand and they think that this is the way that we're supposed to be drawing now. And I'm like, absolutely not. That's insane. Like if I had to do this every time I tried to draw Batman, I would just, I wouldn't even want to do it. Like my, my philosophy and this is weird for both of both this and this is like, we master this. So we'd never have to use it. 
yeah. if that makes sense, right? Like I want to understand all this stuff and I want to learn all this stuff so that when I draw, I'm just like doing contour and I'm nailing my contours. That way also you're informed when you draw like this curve. It's not yeah. just, you're just not hopping it blindly, but you understand that's the gluteus maximus right into the uh, vastus lateralis, into the, the tendon of the hamstring. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're understanding your C-curves and your S-curves when you get to it. So that's ultimately what it comes down to. For me. And I'll, I'll be the first person to admit that I am not, um, you know, solid on my uh, anatomy, um, semantics and language of the actual names of the muscles. Uh, and but I know it comes in handy when it comes to communicating. So yeah, I think there's a benefit to doing that. And I, I see that benefit when you're communicating uh, feedback. Believe to, me, it came at a cost. Uh, I, I memorized all these muscle names. But I think I had to like squeeze out other information out of my brain. So now I know that this is the extensor carpi radialis longus, but I can't tell you my mom's birthday. Like I don't. Sorry, mom. I love you. Oh my god! I'm you just kidding. Just, you, you totally went there in this webinar. <laughs> her birthday is December thirty first. I'm just kidding. I know her birthday, but there's other phone oh, numbers. No. I now that's all gone. I know the the what you focus on and you know what falls off. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Well, guys, I mean. Uh, we've been going for about an hour and almost 20 minutes. And uh, I just want to, you know, say thank you, Christian, for just spending a lovely, you know, 70, 80 minutes of just shooting a breeze when it comes to something dear, near and dear to my heart, which is figure drawing, anatomy, uh, you know, being a better artist, use of tools, uh, you know, being influenced by, the masters, you know, learning philosophies. We, we covered a ton of ground in this conversation and I'm sure we could keep going. Um, but, uh, we have our lives, we have our wives, <laughs> our girlfriends. So, so at some point, all good things have to come to an end, but uh, I just want to tell you that on behalf of CGMA, uh, thank you for sharing yourself with us. Um, and to the attendees, thank you for being a part of this experience, uh, bringing your enthusiasm and your questions for the subject matter. Um, on behalf of CG May, my name is Frank Cordero, and it was a pleasure to host this webinar. Thank you very much, and we are signing off. Dude, Bye, guys. man, you rock. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, dude. Frank, this was awesome. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, you know, I, I was trying to find a way to keep the the questions, you know, you know, question and answer, get to them, but keep it flowing. And I think we I think we did it, you know. Yeah, it, good. you know, felt fluid. I think. I hope it did. You yeah, know, and it was a good uh, talk. yeah, man, dude, uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. You know, the way we did and the conversation and all that, dude. And I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, looking at the webinar again um, and and um, framing some of these little moments that we have, uh, you know, for our uh, CGMA audience. So thank you thank for you. putting this all together. I, I really appreciate it. It was a blast meeting you and getting to know you and talking. Um, Enjoy your weekend, man. That's going to be good. I will. Yeah. That's it. I'm sure you will. Awesome. All right, buddy. Take care. All right. Have a good one. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. Bye. All right. All right.